Heavenly Father, we rely upon you for your help from above, Lord, as we are mere mortals upon this earth. And it is by your mercy and by your grace, Father, that we can even come before you through the atonement, the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, We thank you for the purity of your word in a, a dark age, Lord, that we live in, in a time that is difficult for both pastors and congregants to stay faithful. Lord, you are the one who is faithful. You are a steadfast rock, and you give us your covenant promises from above, and you even engage us, O oh Lord, in your covenant through the blood of Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the, the power of your word against all odds, against all adversaries and oppositions. O oh Lord, your word has shown itself to be triumphant over the ages from creation, from the birth of creation, you commanding things into existence through the power of Christ and his voice. And the Lord, even now we hear your voice speaking to us, to our souls, from your holy writ. We thank you so much for this time in your name. Amen. Well, I want to invite you to turn in if you haven't seen the screen already. I think it was up there. But what Gabe, what Gabe uh, gave you as far as the, the, the reading of God's word is actually the passage that we want to look at today. So I do want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to our passage, and that is 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, verse 14 through 15. And uh, I got to tell you, uh, this is a small passage, only two verses, and yet I am uh, keeping my eye on the clock because I think there is so much here in store for us that you, you're going to be amazed at what God would have to share for, with us from His Word and actually teach to our souls. I want to begin by uh, before reading the passage, or rereading it, actually, uh, I want to just talk a little bit about uh, what is your impression about when you hear the word, the church. And uh, some of us uh, have been around the church for a, a while, so that's a no-brainer. We can pass that test with flying colors with all the verses next to it. But just think about it in general, even the people outside the doors, uh, people across the street, across the road, down the highway, uh, what is their impression of, uh, when they say the church, what is their impression? What comes to their minds as far as things that are visualized and that sort of thing? On, on maybe a, a very base or a simplistic, uh, even in an unbelieving level, uh, some people might say the church is a building. Uh, it could be made of steel or glass, or it could be made of, 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 of marble or, or, or masonry or, or wood. But it's, it's an edifice, it's a structure, and it has windows and doors and usually something that exalts your soul upward, uh, looking up to God like a, a arch, an archway or something like that, but they think in very much uh, concrete uh, material uh, terms. The church is a building, they would say, and, and hopefully it has some good things in it going on as far as making us cheerful for those two main times in which we attend this place, which is Christmas and Easter, and hopefully the Christmas tree looks nice, and, and the lights are around the edges of the tree really give it a festive appeal, and hopefully, hopefully the, the food matches the goodness of the fellowship inside and all those kind of things. And it's really an experience, uh, maybe once a year, maybe twice a year. And beyond that, it's just, it's just a building. There are other of us, and I think most of us in this room would say, no, that's, that's erroneous. Actually, the church is the gathered people of God, the called ones, uh, who are called into fellowship, called into worship. And uh, this is something that is on the supernatural plane. It's something that God does in saving people unto himself and unto his fellowship. And there are some people who would be uh, very honest with you, uh, even coming out of the world. Maybe uh, some people work here more than five days a week. Some people may work longer than that, very long hours. And they would come to you and say, hey, look, when I'm working through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday... Uh, I'm working around unbelievers, and perhaps I I have an unbeliever in my household that makes things very difficult, and so when Sunday comes around, it is truly a day of rest, not just resting, you know, getting my breath back and that sort of thing, but even being away from those ungodly elements that kind of wear at my soul, the way people use the Lord's name in vain, the way they just treat the Bible like trash in their speech, and then I come to Sunday, and I'm able to come to this oasis, this refuge of, of, of where I can find hope in a time of trouble after seeing so much trouble around me. And there are, there are people who actually in church fellowships would say that's the number one thing. It is an oasis. It is a refuge. 
there are some who would, who would go, and I would kind of fall in this category myself, who say, when I think of church, I think of, of worship, what we just did with song and with prayer, and, and even now with the Word, I think of worship. Uh, I, I, I use this by default sometimes, even when I'm describing church to another person, I'm using it synonymous with the church saying the word worship. I don't know, some of you recall when we were getting through the COVID era, the COVID time, and uh, some people had to hold their families back, and, and maybe the, the parent, one parent would go while the other kids stay home with mom or vice versa with dad. But, you know, I would come home sometimes, and one of my kids would be sick or two would be sick, and what would my wife say when I come home? How was worship? And worship is just synonymous with church. And, and that's okay, by the way. I think that's a, a good thing to meditate on. But even with that, some people would even take it a step further and say, um, if we have a marquee on the front of our church or, or, or something above the doorway that says who we are, uh, why don't we call ourselves the worship center? Why don't we direct people not to the sanctuary, but we'll direct them to the worship center? Not a bad idea as far as just way of just communicating things. Not a bad idea. That's what's going on here is worship. But I want to take that idea and, and give it a little bit of a, a jab, if, if you will. And what if you were to replace that word, uh, say you had it in steel letters at the top of the door, the worship center. What if you were to replace that word worship with the word truth? The truth center. <laughs> now, some people would go, I don't know about that. That sounds um, a little bit, uh, sounds a little pr arrogant, <laughs> a little prideful. I mean, you are the central depository for truth. This is the truth center. You want truth? You'll find it here. There are some, perhaps even church leaders on and off who may go, eh, that may not pass before the board or something to that effect. But the passage that we're going to look at today really explains how uh, when you come into a worship center, or if you call it the sanctuary, with fellow brothers and sisters with the word open, you are actually coming into the truth center. And the Apostle Paul explains to us this from 1 Timothy chapter uh, 3, verse 14 through 15. I'm going to read it again for you. Uh, the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy, who's away from him. There's obviously a sign of distance between uh, him and, and Paul and Timothy, his, his son in the faith. But Paul is writing some things that he, he can't get to Timothy. He wants to disciple him more. He can't get to him. So what does he do? He, he writes him a letter. And this is what we're reading here is actually Paul's letter to Timothy. And this will iron out for us uh, this relationship between uh, the worship center, I would just call it the church, and, and the truth center effectively is what it becomes when, when all things engage together. Paul writes in verse 14, I hope to come to you soon. He's writing his son in the faith. But I am writing these things so that if I delay, if I'm held back, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. And that's that last part in verse 15 takes it all. The church is the pillar and the buttress, the support of the truth. And I'm going to get to that towards the end. I'm going to try to save my thunder for the last part uh, in God's timing, and God's planning, in the chronological order of things with verses before us. But that's an amazing statement to say. And there are these times when you read God's Word and on first review, first, first run, dry run of Scripture, you go, oh yeah, I know this passage. I know this passage. I've read this passage before. Yeah, but yeah, 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 yeah. And then you, you look, you do a double take and you go, wow, I can't believe that God actually said that, that, that the church is that. And we'll get to that in a minute. It's very important for us to understand all these things. The purpose of our time, plainly stated, is, is that today, or I should say tonight, we are looking at the symbiotic Forgive my big use of words. We are looking at the symbiotic relationship of the church and the truth so that you will uphold that which upholds you. Let me say that again. We're going to look at the symbiotic relationship of the church and truth so that you will uphold that which upholds you. And symbiotic is one of those words that if you're a biology major or something like that, you know how things work underneath the water with certain animals and plants, and they, they rub off each other, and they actually are 
in a, in a way, uh, working together uh, on an organic level. And this is what we have on many levels, on many ways with regards to the church on one hand and truth on the other. They are not separate. They're very much joined at the hip. They're very much joined in the spirit. And we're going to see the wonders of that in a minute. The first observation from this text is, 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 is plain and it's ordinary and it's pedantic and it's something you've heard before. The second observation is going to take some time. So I just want to prepare you for that in advance. The first observation is that the church, plainly stated, is obviously, by verse 14 and a bit of 15, the church is upheld by the truth. What do we see Paul doing here? Well, we understand on the face, and when you look at that, we see Paul is giving another person, whose name is Timothy, exhortation, and, and he's, he's urging, uh, something's urgent here, he wants to meet with Timothy, he can't meet with dis- Timothy because of distance, and so he says, I'm going to write, <laughs> what is he going to write? He's going to write six whole chapters on how the church should be ordered and how it should be behaving in its, in its outworkings. That's what Paul is doing. And so what this, uh, though on the face, is just basically Paul communicating something on, on the face, when you look really into the words of what's going on here, we are understanding observation number one is that the church is upheld by the truth. That is to say, the church, the people of God, need instruction. They need the truth. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm, well, I do know about you because I can tell how old you are by looking at you, but for the most part. Um, but if you've been here long enough, you're, some of you say, after I reach the age of 16 or 17 or something like that, I'm pretty much mature and I've got it down. And you can say that maybe um, the Christian life as well too. If I've been in Christian for like, come on, five years, I know the Bible. I got this. And uh, you know what the reality can be is that uh, you and I uh, don't got this, (laughs) that we actually need instruction. Um, We need even sometimes, and this sounds very rudimentary, but we need repetition Something coming back to us over and over again, going like this. This is what it says. You see what it says? That's what I'm saying, is what God is saying. And to do that, uh, perhaps even, I'll go so far as to say, Sunday to Sunday among fellow believers. That is what Paul is saying here. He's, He's indicating in his words there's an urgency at stake here. And that is that this church, no matter if they're just a couple years young or if they're well into their their mid-years or whatever, they need instruction. And this is a, a way of a, really a, a humble exhortation for us, if, if we're humble, we'll receive it as such, that we need instruction. And what is Paul talking about? Uh, we understand his urgency, and we understand the distance, we understand the help of letters. This is before the time of text and email. But what is he saying? I, that you may do something. What is the thing that we're supposed to do? What is it so urgent? What is the urgency? that the church, that you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. Paul says that you know, that one may know how to behave in the household of God. On the face, of course, most of us would say, that sounds normal. And you know what? There's this word that describes a lot of scripture, and it is the word, I love, I love the fact that my wife introduced me to this word a long time ago, it's prosaic. There are some aspects of Scripture that are prosaic, and what prosaic means is it's normal. It's like the sun that goes over your head midday. You see it every day. It's part of normal living, but at the same time, it's essential, like oxygen. If you have oxygen in your lungs, yes, that is a day-to-day thing, gets kind of normal, but what happens if you take away the oxygen? You suffocate, and it's the same thing with regards to uh, prescriptive things, things that have to do with behavior and conduct and order and all those kind of things. If you read the whole book of Timothy, all six chapters, what you're going to find out about it is that it is very much instructive in the day-to-day things of the church. Now, again, I use the illustration of oxygen. If I take away your oxygen, suddenly you appreciate oxygen a lot, right? And so it is with regards to order, the order of things of church. If we did not have a, a sense of construct or, 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 or form and, and, and definition, we would be left out, hanged to dry. Of course, Satan would come in and probably take advantage of this situation where there is no actual rules within the household. You know, uh, this just by way of 
even experience. I'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, some of you uh, are familiar with uh, going from perhaps a household that had rules, not too many, but enough of them for them to just to have a sense of sanity. And maybe the other household, household B, they didn't have any rules. It was a free-for-all. Just do whatever you want to do and just go crazy. And it's interesting, I've come across this more than once. I'll come to a household where the, the household head is doing his job, mom's doing her job, and the kids are laughing. They're having fun. Uh, perhaps they're having too much fun, but they're enjoying one another because they know their boundaries, and it helps things move along. It helps foster relationships. This is on a very practical level, of course. But then you go to a, a, a household, and maybe you've, you've seen one or you encountered one where uh, both parents are gone, the kids are almost practically orphaned within the, the four walls of the house, and it could be a rich house, it could be a poor house, doesn't matter the economical, economic state of living, but because there are no rules in the house, no structure, no organization, what is everybody like? Huh. <sighs> just thinking about myself, just thinking about myself, just thinking about myself. And it's interesting, you would think it's the reverse. When we, when we say, let go and be free and just do whatever you want and no rules, then, then you would just be enjoying the bounty of life, but it's just the reverse, just the reverse with regards to many households with no rules. The Apostle Paul sees the analogy of, of the family and the church here using this word, uh, the household of God. We as a church must conduct ourselves in an orderly way, Paul is saying. And I wouldn't say that this is something that is arbitrary or even optional. Well, you know, uh, I come from the kind of thinking that says yes to Jesus, but not so much to Paul. Paul's a little bit of a radical guy. Paul's a little bit too much for me. Well, I got news for you. I got news for you. Paul is an extension of Christ's ministry on the earth. Paul is an extension of what Christ said when he was on the earth to us codifying the law of Christ, the rule of Christ upon the earth through instruction. So Paul is not, you know this from the Damascus Road account of his life, he is not an arbitrary figure that just comes on the scene and imposes arbitrary laws. No, this is something from the, the regal head who is Jesus Christ our Lord through Paul. You might say, what are the, the things that he's talking about? Behave in the household of God. Well, you read the rest of the book and you find out eventually that he's talking about things like roles of peoples who are in leadership, elders, deacons. He's talking about the, the needs of, of particular members of a church, how to care for widows, how to parse off the, the young widows who are, could easily remarry again for a second time because their husbands are, are gone from this earth. He's writing about household issues that are real, that are practical. And what Paul is saying is here is the church needs instruction. This is something that goes right against this mindset that says it's a free-for-all, we're a motley crew, go out, do whatever you want. Now, it is true that the church is a motley crew. If you look at us, we come from different backgrounds uh, in, in your own church setting as well, too. You can just think about this. The different kinds of people that come through the door sometimes are vastly different in so many different ways. And I'm just talking about hairstyles and things like that. But they come from different backgrounds, and yet they are called to one assimilated order that has to do with loving the one another, loving God and loving others, and then the whole thing about communion, baptism, participating in those things with respect, with honor, the whole thing about uh, the church order of things as well. Chapter 2 just says a lot of it. I'll just kind of summarize it this way. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we, that is talking about the church, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. That's verse 2. So that's the, that's the goal here. It's, it, it has to be with peace. It has to do with order. It's saying again, this is not just a free-for-all. Go this way, go that way, doesn't matter just have fun. The Apostle Paul is one who wanted uh, the church to function like a unified family. And if you've seen a unified family, you know what they're about. I'm just going to give you some key words to describe this. Definition, they're defined by a family name. Legacy, they have a history behind their name that 
they are continually trying to make uh, or see become richer, a sense of family honor, a sense of roles and relationship that go corresponding with each other and family growth with that. So that's the structured blossoming, if you will, of the household of God. It involves all those things, and this would apply for an individual family and for, for a church fellowship family as well. A good question to ask as we kind of peer into these things and let them talk to us, let them talk to our souls as well, is does my church follow Paul's template, or am I of a rogue fellowship of some kind? And that can easily weed itself into the church. You don't need Paul. Paul, is a, he's, a, he's one of those radical guys. And uh, you don't want to be with the radicals. You want to be with the, the people who are mainline, sort of in the center. And that's sad news if somebody believes that. Because Paul, again, is an extension of Christ from the road of Damascus in Acts. That's the first point uh, of, our, of our time. And it, it involves confrontation. All these things involve confrontation confronting uh, self-autonomy, self-sufficiency, ultra-privacy. Those are things that can stand in the way of fellowship. It can stand away in the order of things just saying, uh, saying a cop-out, I just don't have time to spend with you, or something like that. Any of those things can weed into the weight of fellowship and erode things from the inside out. But the church is dependent upon instruction. The church, and even in their older years, know, needs to know how to behave in the household of God. And this is showing to us the evidence that the church is upheld by the truth. These are uh, simple illustrations from Scripture, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to engage with them before I go to the, the next point because I think they're important. They, they harmonize what Paul is saying. Is that when you talk about uh, the church being one foundation, Jesus Christ and his teachings, they're, they're underneath our feet. And this is important. They are the foundation. I'm standing on a, a flat area. If I was standing on something that was angled like this from an angle, I'd go rolling off the stage, right? So this is a, a stable, firm foundation that I'm standing upon. And when the saints go forward, they need to be standing on a firm foundation that's, that they're actually relying upon and, and something that's upholding them. Same author, different book. The Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 through 21, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, and whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Now you get the sense that what's going on there with the church is not flying around like some some, some bird in the sky going this way, that way, all the way around. It's steadied, it's stayed upon the teachings of the apostles, the prophets, and Christ brings it all together, keeps the whole structure as a cornerstone fixed together as the cornerstone. That is a church that is ready to go forward in battle, that kind of church, that kind of dynamic. And that's the kind of dynamic we need from Paul. Another observation has to do with... Uh, the spiritual union we have with God as the church is coming together in one communion. And there's a, something in the spiritual plane that is a little bit on the more mysterious side because it is of the things of the spirit and not of the flesh. But listen now to a, a different writer, same theology, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. This fleshes out what we read earlier about us being part of the household of God, which is the church, this is important, of the living God. God is alive, he's near, and he's active in our midst as we do the self-disciplined things of upholding the truth, upholding that which is right as far as our conduct and our behavior. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, He, that is God, has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become, and this is amazing, partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. We engage in something that we cannot entirely explain with our own language. In some way, somehow, through the work of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Word and the power of God's salvation, when we come together, we are partakers of the divine nature. So you can see when Paul is saying this, this is not a, something that we just whisk over or just leapfrog over and forget. We are the household of God, the church of the living God, the God who is alive and he is working, even when you think he is not, he is still working among his people, 
Amazing, amazing. These are some, some of these things are pedantic. They're old-fashioned. You've heard them before, maybe in a different sermon, but they're worth repeating because they, they're found in our scriptures. Observation one was the church is upheld by the truth. It's not a quantum leap to get over that one. We pretty much understand that if we've been part of the church for a long time, that we are upheld by God's word. Observation number two, this one takes some time. The truth is upheld by the church. Wow. And of course, just to be careful, we're not saying with independence and autonomy, we are dependent upon the God of our salvation. We're dependent upon the cross. We're dependent on the atonement of Jesus Christ. We're, we're dependent on God's illumination coming into our minds, our brains, opening our eyes to what the scriptures say. But what does it say here? We're going to find out that the truth is upheld by the church. Amazing. And when I talk about truth, I'm going to get into the, the, the upheld part in just a minute. But when I talk about the, the truth, it is something that is uh, worth giving a little bit of a pause about and, and trying to explain that. Uh, what are you saying, John, that the, the, the church is like Vatican II or maybe Vatican III? We are like the popes in, in all this. We write scripture? No, I'm not saying that. That's not what I said. That's not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying we are the pillar and the support, the buttress of the truth. Uh, when the world sees us, they see people who uphold the truth, who proclaim Christ and his empty grave, his power over death. That's what the church sees. That's what the world sees, and that's what uh, churches should see w with other churches, with each other. But I want to get into this word truth. Aletheia is the word for truth uh, that's worth looking at. Because when I was studying this word for Aletheia truth, I came upon the observation that it's kind of a circular thing. Uh, what do you believe in? I believe in truth. What is that? It's true. <laughs> Okay, um, we're, I feel like I'm going in a circle. And even when I looked up Aletheia in the, the Abbott Smith uh, lexicon, lexicon, Greek lexicon, I opened it up, Aletheia. First thing it says is Christian doctrine. Okay, what is Christian doctrine? Look up some more words. It's the core teachings of what? Of truth. Okay, wait a second, wait a second. You just took me in an entire circle. What are, what are we talking about with truth? And I feel it is necessary to put some meat on the bone, if you don't mind me using that expression. Put some meat on the bone when we talk about truth. Think about uh, somebody who never heard this word or even this concept of one governing sovereign truth for all times, for eternity. Uh, that's a strange concept to a lot of people. More people are, cons more people are used to Don Lemon from CNN talking about, well, this is my truth, my personal truth, you see, and you have yours over there in the corner. Well, uh, this is not that. This is all authoritative, top-down from God, from, from the very works of Jesus Christ and his work and his words, that we have this thing called truth in our possession. And it's an amazing thing. What is truth? That is the question, by the way, that Pilate asked Jesus in John chapter 18 before Jesus was sentenced to an unrightful death. Pilate said these words, same same sentiment, the same comeback of our modern people in this world today. What is truth? And I don't think Pilate was genuinely asking that. He was just pretty much throwing his arms up and saying, I give up. And that's what many people today do. They, they give up. We do not have to do that. And it's worthwhile to actually tell people that when we're talking about truth, we're talking about objective truth. We're not talking about aletheia, as even though it has sort of a windy feel to it. Aletheia sounds like, you know, something like windy. But it's talking about something that's riveted down that you can point to and say, that is God's truth. That is what you can stake everything on, your whole life, your soul, on the covenants of Jesus Christ, his covenant promises, and everything that come with that. So what is truth? What is truth? I want to answer that question uh, in, a, in somewhat of an analytical way, but I'm not going to get mired too much in the details. But I think it's necessary for us to do this. I had an opportunity to talk to a man by the name of Cameron at the Bayshore Mall this one time. Cameron only knew one verse in the entire Bible, something about Jesus and the demoniac or the, the man possessed by a demon. And that's all Cameron knew as I talked to him in the, 
in the food court area of that big edifice. And it was like just working with a clean slate, nothing, nothing really known about the Bible, nothing really known about truth. Where do you begin? And a good place to begin, uh, possibly, is just to break things down into categories. When we talk about truth, we are talking about eight, count them, eight supreme topics which come up, arise again and again between the pages of Genesis through Revelation. The first one is the supreme topic of who God is. Who is God? The triune God of the Bible. Who is he? How is he defined? How does he define himself? Secondly, when we're talking about truth, we're talking about the Bible. The Bible is a commentary to itself. It talks about it being authoritative for all times. It talks about, the Bible talks about it being like honey from the honeycomb. It's something that's delicious and it should meet with you with your delight. Even when it's telling you a rule or commandment, it's delightful like honey. The Bible talks about uh, uh, angels, the world of angels. And some people would say, uh, you don't need to believe in angels I say you do because the Apostle Paul and Peter, when they write, they say, beware of that fallen angel named Satan who roams around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. If you take that away like oxygen, guess what? People are going to get hit. They're going to get hit big time. The doctrine of man. What is a man? What is a woman? You can find those answers in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. Sin. What is sin? Sin is disobedience against God's commandment, is lawlessness, is actually grieving the Holy Spirit, and sin leads to death. If there was no sin in the world, if Adam never sinned, we would not have the thing, we would not have funerals. You would say, what is a funeral? I don't know, because there's no death in the world. But because there is death in the world and sin in the world is what I meant to say, there, are, there is this word funeral. Salvation. What is salvation? That is where God saves a person by, by grace through faith, through God's sovereign election, and a person comes to saving faith, and, and they are saved from their sins that would otherwise send them to hell. The church, what is the church? That's what we're covering right here, the household of God. The church is the called out ones, the ecclesia. And finally, the end times, covering heaven and hell, and as well as Christ's second return. Part of the thing that is part of the Christian life is not just in retrospect, looking back at the finished work of Jesus Christ, it is also looking forward to his return. You'll find out that many Bible writers, many New Testament writers, when they write, they talk about persevering unto the Lord's second coming, not just in retrospect, not just looking at the cross behind us, but also looking ahead. So all these things are part of truth, and, and they're all tied together in the very person and the work of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one who said in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And this is a beautiful scene where you see, uh, especially in the Gospel of John, but also in other writings of Paul, an emphasis on truth with Christ, truth with Christ, truth with Christ. So this is uh, enormous. And, and if you get your, the sense that this is like you're your swimming in an ocean that's deep and wide and two miles deep, you start to get the sense of this is overwhelming, and it should. If I'm not talking in majestic, wide, deep terms concerning truth, I must be talking about something that is not the truth of the Bible, because the, tr but the truth of the Bible is just that. It's deep, it's wide, and it even causes you to fear. If you're in the middle of the ocean, the Pacific Ocean, and you look this way, that way, that way, that way, no shoreline, and underneath you is two miles of water to the floor, you do this. Some people will just totally freak out, and, and they'll, they'll go bonkers. But that's what the truth of God's Word is like when you enter into it, and you start to see these categories come out at you, all eight categories, you start to have a sense of your heart beating with trepidation. By the way, just by way of assignment, if you want to ever uh, go through the Bible, through, the, through a one year of Bible reading, uh, I would suggest go through eight of these categories and just with a pen, just mark down one by one. This is talking about God. This is talking about sin. This is talking about angels. This is talking about end times, salvation, sin, man. And it's amazing where those things will just come out verse after verse. It's inescapable. There's no portion of scripture that does not talk about one of those eight things that I described earlier, describing objective truth. So objective truth is that, but it's also personal. It's the person of Jesus Christ, 
and his legacy throughout the ages. Now, I'm going to stop here for a minute and get my breath back. <laughs> the word is majestic, as deep as the ocean, as wide. But here's the amazing thing from our passage, and we must drink this in. We must, we, we, we must let this penetrate our minds that what the Apostle Paul is saying here is, church, get up. Get up and get underneath the truth because you're going to be a pillar. You're going to be a buttress of the truth. And at this point, I, if people don't do it overtly, I think in their minds, their hands are going to go up and say, wait a second, <laughs> wait a minute. What are you saying? I mean, you just described Scripture Aletheia, truth, as like an ocean. I don't know anybody who gets underneath the floor of the ocean and starts trying to lift it up. That's impossible. And yet God has placed us in a position where we are proclaiming Christ and we're doing something that is enormous. No ordinary human can do this. But a collection of humans called the church can, by the power of God, lift up the truth and proclaim Christ in his majesty. I want you to uh, consider some verses that illustrate this idea, this concept of God actually using human agents to lift things that are bigger than themselves. We see this in Scripture in the New Testament, uh, the, the church being called the pillar of the temple of my God. Revelation chapter 3, verse 12 says, the one who conquers, that's Christ talking to his church, who's persevering, the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go uh, out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. It's amazing the church being pictured as a pillar of a temple. Uh, Revelation chapter 21, verse 12 through 14 this is amazing. Uh, most of us, when we were talking about the New Jerusalem, and it's another word for heaven, heaven coming down uh, by the might and the power of God, and if somebody were to tell you that the sides of the kingdom of God, the temple, the edifice, has words on it, most of us, by our own design, or by our own ways, our own conventions, would say, it must be the names of God. Yahweh, Adonai, Elohim, those are the names around the New Jerusalem. But what does the scripture say? Heaven, the new Jerusalem, had a great high wall, 12 gates, and at the 12 gates, 12 angels, and on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of, of Israel were inscribed on them, one on the east, uh, three on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the, the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And in my mind, Judas' name is most likely replaced with Matthias of the book of Acts, who replaced Judas. But that's an amazing thing. On the sides of the New Jerusalem, get this, are the names of mortals, people from tribes, the 12 tribes, the, the, the 12 disciples. And God puts their names on the side of the New Jerusalem, his edifice. Amazing. This is an example of how God boldly and amazingly uses a human agent to, to engage us in the things having to do with his radiance and his majesty and even the royalty of Jesus Christ, our Lord. You see this in the New Testament, but interestingly, you don't see it just there. You also see using God, using human agents as his pillar, his support for his truth in the Old Testament. You say, Where on, what on earth are you talking about, John? Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 8. I'm talking about the Ark of the Covenant. If you read uh, Hebrews chapter 9, you will find out the contents of the Ark of the Covenant contained uh, Aaron's rod that was budding. Secondly, articles of manna. And thirdly, the law of Moses. The writings of Moses on stone tablets were in the Ark of the Covenant. And this is what you see in Deuteronomy 10. At that time, the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi, to carry the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister to Him, and to bless His name to this day. Mere mortals, mere men, are called to become Levi's priests, and they are to lift up the Ark of the Covenant that contains the law of God. Amazing. 
amazing. There's even a dark day in, in the history of Israel when this was forgotten. The time of the judges is a time in which there is no law. In fact, you can read the entire book of Judges. You'll never hear the word law written in any verse of the book of Judges. That was a time when every man was doing what was right in his own eyes. You go right later on to 2 Samuel chapter 6. You read about King David. He's welcoming the ark. The ark is coming to him. He's going to bring it back, and it's going to be glorious. And what happens? The ark is found to be pulled, not lifted up by Levitical priests anymore. What's happened now is on the back of a cart being pulled by oxen. And you know the story. There's a man by the name of Uzzah who sees the ark of the cart, <laughs> he sees the cart wobbling, and the ark of the covenant containing the law of Moses is starting to wobble and fall off the side of the cart. And what does Uzzah do? He puts up his hand and he says, I'll catch it. And God strikes him down dead on the spot. David gets furious, he gets angry. And in a matter of one verse, David shudders and he's held steadfast. He's like, God could do this to me as well. That's right, David. God could do this to you as well. If you're treating his word like something that would be dragged around by a bunch of animals rather than lifted up by men on rods, and you're treating his word that way, yeah, that can happen to you as well, David. And he shudders and he, he pulls back. This is a reminder that God, when he says, I want human agents involved with this, God means he wants human agents involved with this. The same thing with regards to the church today being a, a buttress and a support of the truth. Though it is profound, though, though it is beyond us, if God wants it, then we do it. We proclaim Christ. We proclaim the purity of his word. We live it out in our behavior. And we bro boldly pro proclaim the things that are too big for us to hold ourselves. This is something that all finally leads to worship. And this is something unique about the, the writings of the Apostle Paul is how he will do a, a breakout session. Sometimes when you come to these conferences, all of a sudden they have a, a, what's called a breakout session. Uh, um, a new guy comes on the scene and he's going to do just a short snippet of, of preaching. They call it breakout sessions. Paul does sort of a breakout session of worship when he's internalizing the wonders and the majesty of God with the church being raised up and then the church itself becoming a support mechanism, lifting on high the covenants of God and the testimonies of Christ in the aletheia, the truth, what does Paul do? He backs off and he does this thing called worship. Verse 16, great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. How can you put these things in a bottle? How can, you, can you, how can you contain them? They're too big for us. This is a mystery, the mystery of godliness. He was manifest. He starts breaking out into a testimony, a song of Christ. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Paul can just... He does the appropriate thing, what we should all do when we're coming across something that is too majestic for us, for our, our feeble brains to fully wrap around. We, we have to take a pause and just pull back and say, Lord, uh, who is sufficient for these things? Not I, O oh Lord, not I. And yet God will take a one, a single person, a whole church, a body of, of believers who are struggling hard at it week after week, and he will say, no, I'm pushing you back in the game. I'm pushing you back in the center to be that pillar to uphold the holy law of God, to uphold the gospel of our salvation. And God places us for that very purpose. This is a great reminder to us to not be discouraged, do not give into a discouragement, to not give into temptation, to sin, do not give into the mindset of, of becoming a rogue, independent Christian who's just on his own, going to do his own thing independent of other people. That is rebellion. God is interested in assimilation. That's our word for today. Assimilation. We want to assimilate ourselves to something that is bigger than us. And that thing is the gospel of Jesus Christ, his atonement, his work on the cross, his finished work. In our proclamation, 
In it, though our voices in our, the, the diaphragm of our lungs may be weak at times and so sore with other things, we proclaim him who is able to take other, others out of the grave, to take them out of their spiritual deadness and breathe into them new life that they never had before, that they've never experienced before ever once. This is the proclamation of the church. This is how the church remains steadfast while being built up and supported by the truth, preaches the truth, proclaims the truth, and does it diligently until the Lord shall return. Let us pray. Our great and heavenly Father, we thank you for, uh, um, Lord, though we are not qualified uh, in of our flesh, in of our, our, our fleshly mortal being, Lord, you have engaged us in, in a very secure place. And Lord, we receive the benefits of your holy writ. We receive the benefits of Jesus Christ being the truth, the life, and the way. But help us, O oh Lord, to capture the vision, Lord, that you would have for us in our human engagement, Lord, as a mere uh, band of brothers and sisters, Lord, that you would, uh, we would see in our own lifetime uh, spiritual growth in the things that are hard and even seemingly impossible for us to take on. And Lord, if you were able to raise up the Levitical priesthood, you are surely, o Lord, able to raise up the church and, Lord, make us behave in the way that we ought to behave and help us to conform and assimilate to the things you would want us to assimilate to. Help us not to be a rogue group, Lord, that wants to just do their own thing independent of you, but help us to be actively dependent under your throne of grace. We pray all this in your name. Amen.